Byron Scholes at Stanford University. Excellent. Well, as you can tell, this is a fireside chat with very little instructions to either one of us as to what we should do or how we should do it. So we're just going to have some fun. Okay. Um, I, I think you know we understand this uh, event has been very much focused on venture capital. And, and there's a great number of uh, successful venture capitalists in the audience and founders of companies and, and a variety of other people that are part of this ecosystem. Um, we're happy to talk about venture capital today, uh, but I think uh, what we're really going to do is just ask each other questions, uh, either around venture capital or areas that we're interested in, more around long-term investing uh, and, and capital for longer term investment opportunities of which venture capital clearly is one of those. So wh why don't I start out and uh, in fact I'm just going to ask you, uh, you know, um, what is it that you're most passionate about today when it comes to the topic of long term investing? Well, I actually, uh, I, my topic of investing is really my passion as of late and basically I just am very upset with the models that are used in uh, your uh, endowment fund and others which really concentrate on the idea of relative performance. So you'd have venture capital investments and you compare them to other venture capital funds and every and all investment is done in a relative value model and also a constrained model wherein you put so much into equities, you put so much into bonds, you put so much into VC, you put so much into uh, private equity, all static, no dynamics, and all relative. And the investment is not relative, investment is absolute. And what I'm very passionate about is moving the thinking away from this idea of concentrating on how we're doing relative to someone else, to thinking about how it is that we grow the value of our portfolio. How do we grow those assets? So it's the compound return that's crucial for given levels of drawdown. And when you concentrate on compound return, it just changes your focus tremendously from talking about static buckets or, or relative performance. And for me, the most important thing in compound return is not the mean so much as risk. It's the tails of the distribution that have the greatest effect on compound return. And understanding compound return is just far different from the whole model that has been used for the last 30 years and is currently in place. If you concentrate on risk, then you understand in the VC business, it's not how you do on average. It's really how you do in the tails to minimize as much of the downside as possible, but to participate on each investment. If you have positive skewness, positive probability of great payoff, it's not on average that you buy 10 VC deals or 15 VC deals. It's every deal you can make it pay off. That's the great way in which you create value and mitigating the downside. Concentrating on risk is so much different from compounding, from concentrating on return. And everyone concentrates on return. And the way you make money in returns is not to say that I'm more skillful than someone else. It's really to understand what, in my view, the constraints are of the other persons you're involved with. And we were talking earlier today, and I was very interested in the movement of your fund to actually be more directly involved in VC investing. And I was wondering why you felt that there was constraints you could be mitigating that basically could add value for not only uh, your endowment fund, but also for the University of California. Thank you for, for covering a number of uh, things in there, but I, I think what I pick up from you is that managing risk is more important than seeking returns. Um, and so maybe just a little bit of context. At the University of California, uh, I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that we have 10 campuses in the state uh, three national energy labs. Um, we also have a, a diverse array of agriculture and natural resource centers that cover the whole state. Um, what we manage in, in my office, which is called the office of the CIO, is certainly the endowment, which is about $10 billion. Um, and then we have the defined benefit plan, 
the defined contribution plan, the working capital for the university, and the captive insurance for the university. Collectively, that's about $105 billion across the various pools of capital. We've been investing in venture capital now dating back almost 30 years, and we had the privilege of being involved early on with some of the, the well-regarded, highly successful venture capitalists here in Silicon Valley. Um, of course, the, the landscape has changed in the last 30 years, and I think there's two views. In fact, when I was interviewed for the job almost exactly three years ago, my board asked me, what would I do to access venture capital? Because it's a very closed, knit business. And there's clearly the top firms that have successfully been in the business for 30 plus years. But we have seen in the last 20 or so years, 15 years, new firms spin out from established firms and have become the next generation brand names in venture capital. Um, and so, as we have been thinking about what it is we do, on a base of $105 billion, even if we did get an allocation to venture capital from the top five or six firms, it really wouldn't move the needle, so to speak, um, in our investing in venture capital. So, the more we thought about this, we realized that at the University of California, uh, annually, we spend about $5 billion a year in R&D. We produce about five patents a day. And clearly, there are a number of successful companies that have started from the UC ecosystem. And our traditional model for participating in the success of these companies has been through our technology transfer and licensing office. And to put it in context for you, we make about $100 million a year in royalties from technology transfer and licensing. In the last decade, that's been about a billion dollars. Again, to put that in context for you, our operating budget annually as the UC is about $30 billion. So when we think about what do we do to invest in venture capital, uh, we came to the conclusion that we should find a way to participate in this ecosystem and also try and work around the constraint of technology transfer and licensing, which was making it difficult to find a way to participate in these companies. So our solution to this is to set up a collection of 10 different incubators across our 10 campuses and being the first capital in. For that, we committed about $50 million, and we're on our way to do that with about four or five different incubators now at UCSF, at UCLA, and UC San Diego, and UC Berkeley. The other thing we did is we committed $250 million to create a venture fund that will participate in growth capital for companies coming out of this pipeline of companies in our incubator accelerator ecosystem. And we set it up at arm's length so that we wouldn't have to be skilled internally to, to tackle this. Uh, we hired Vivek Ranadive, who was the founder and CEO of TIPCO and the owner of the Sacramento Kings basketball team, to run the fund for us and hire a professional team on standard market economics. And so all of this after three years now is set up as an ecosystem for us to participate in ideas coming out of the UC. What we are discovering is that more and more innovation is coming out of the research institutions and the universities uh, where the fundamental research is being done. And we're not the only ones. MIT this week is announcing its own 150 plus million dollar fund called the Engine to do something similar. So there is a realization, even for the venture capital community, that finding a way to access this type of entrepreneurial activity at the universities can be very helpful as a source of deals. And that's really what we intend to do, is collaborate with venture capitalists through our efforts so that eventually we're not asking for an allocation. 
but we can demonstrate that we add value by helping solve some constraints within our ecosystem. And of course, as we do that, I hope that we can be more scalable because there's no shortage of the types of ideas and the size of funding that's required for these ideas to evolve. And that's really our strategy to tackle a particular constraint in venture capital and to create a solution. This is not certainly something we can demonstrate has been successful because it's early days, but we take a very long-term perspective to try and compound our returns. And we're doing this with no consideration for how does it benchmark relative to someone else's experiment. And I think when you're a long-term investor, one of the most important things I remind my team is that we're not asset managers, we're risk managers. And we should be focused on looking for the best opportunities where we can find them so that in the long term we can compound our return as opposed right. to being focused on some idiosyncratic benchmark on a quarterly or an annual period. Right. Let me pass it back to you. It's interesting though, you know, in that compound return world, they're trying to make the best experience in your VC or other investments. And if you have a, a longer term perspective, each period matters. That's the interesting phenomenon of compound return. It's not that you say, I can just be there for the longer haul, but if you can control your risk each period of time, you'll have a much better experience than ignoring the interim risk. And when people look at risk, they think on average, this is the risk that I'm taking, but it's every period that really counts because if you start off with 100 and you lose 50% the first year, okay, and then you triple your money, you're going to end up with 150. If you start with 100 and it goes to 300, you lose 50% in the last year, you still end up with 150.